Good morning, Sunrise. Welcome to church. Welcome to church in the field. Good morning to all of you in your chairs out here in the grass. Good morning to all of you in your cars listening on the radio. Give me a little honk if you can hear me on your radio. Yay, everything's working good. Hey, those of the Facebook at home, give me a little honk if you can hear me on Facebook at home. Awesome. You guys are great. Okay. We're so glad to be able to gather as the church and come celebrate the goodness of God. My name is Pastor Kevin. I'm the associate pastor here at Sunrise. And if you're joining us on Facebook, maybe for the first time, welcome to our church. Our whole goal is to love God, to love others, and to live the life that God has called us to live. So you'll hear that a lot in our phrasing, our messaging, because that's what we believe the Christian life is all about. Uh, if you're here in the field, you've got song sheets in your programs. We're going to start worshiping this morning. Uh, if you're home on Facebook, hopefully you can see the lyrics on the screen. But this is an old oldie but a goodie, probably familiar to a lot of you. Let's start standing on the promises of God this morning. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the big standing. Standing on the promises of God my Savior standing. Standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. On the promises they cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God My Savior stands promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ my Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong core, overcoming daily with the Spirit sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing Every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God Let's celebrate! Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God My Savior standing, standing I'm standing on the promises Amen. Good start to our worship this morning. You may be seated if you're here in the field. Pastor Dan has a few announcements for you. We'll do the old switcheroo. Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody. We're glad we can be here, and it's just good to uh, fellowship together and see one another and greet each other. So good morning and uh, welcome. We do have some announcements in the life of Sunrise. I know several of you here got uh, got here after the announcement, but uh, just to let you know, on the uh, welcome table here, we have a voluntary sign-in sheet. Uh, just in case, we're praying that nothing will happen, but just in case uh, COVID-19, is a, there is a breakout. If you wanted to be contacted and, and know that uh, it happened, um, that you can write your information down and we will contact you. This is just for Sunrise. It doesn't go to the government or anybody. This is just a courtesy. If you want to be contacted in case something happens, we can let you know. So that's on the information table. Also, our women's team are, collect they're, are collecting all kinds of things for New Beginnings Home, which is um, a crisis pregnancy type uh, situation for uh, mothers, young mothers, 
and they're collecting things such as burp rags and uh, bottles and also things for the mothers and the, the list is in here and the baskets back on the welcome table if you want to see some of the things that you can share and give uh, that is back there and we want to thank you for uh, doing that as well also we want to thank you for your generous donation of our uh, school supplies uh, to the Puyallup School District and they really appreciated those uh, in just could use those in so many ways Awana, beginning September the 9th, um, all the information's on the program. Um, we're going to do it a little different this year. It's explained in there, so I'm going to let you read that. If you're interested in Discipleship University, I teach that on a Sunday night. It's going to start September 13th, and uh, we will. looks like we will be in the sanctuary. Uh, the youth are going to be in the gym, uh, social distancing. We tried finishing that out last year on Zoom. It worked. I didn't like it that much personally for the interaction. So we're going to try it with social distancing in the sanctuary. It starts at September 13th from 6 to 7.15. Okay. Um, let's see. And there's ways to uh, give on there. And um, I think that's about all the announcements we have in the life of Sunrise right now. So thank you for being here and just sharing in this worship in this beautiful uh, day. I'm hearing from a lot of people, I love worshiping in the field. We ought to do this even if we didn't have COVID-19. So I see a lot of heads shaking out there and a lot of people just enjoying it. And we're glad that God has given us this place, this opportunity to come and worship. So uh, let's pray together. Then we're going to continue in our worship. Father, we thank you so much for the day, beautiful day you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity to worship, worship in freedom. We're reminded that a lot of people around the world don't have this freedom. And so we thank you for that. And we just ask that you would bless as we continue in worship through these beautiful songs and the study of your word. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue in worship with another good classic song that we know called Trust and Obey. And it's something that we sing sometimes without always thinking about the words. Um, the words say, when we walk with the Lord. And I think that's a really important first concept. We're going to be talking this morning as Pastor Dan comes with the message about abiding in Christ. And we're going to be digging deep into what it means to walk with the Lord. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Let's, let's meditate on these words as we sing them. Let's let them be fresh. Speak to us fresh again today about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a But 
See, God doesn't just ask us to obey blindly. He asks us to obey out of relationship, out of the knowledge that he is a good father, that he is trustworthy, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that his promises are forever true, and his mercies are new every morning. But you have to experience that. We have to know that in relationship. It doesn't do me any good to have head knowledge of it. Head knowledge, head knowledge will fail me as soon as crisis strikes because I will, I will fall back into habits and routines and fall back into what's comfortable. If I'm, not, if I'm not comfortable in my abiding relationship with Christ, that won't be the thing I fall back on. It has to be a regular part of our Christian experience so that we can fall back on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Let's just celebrate that, that we have a good father who is trustworthy, and it's out of that trust, that established relationship, that then we can obey what he asks us to do.
you've experienced that abiding relationship with Jesus Christ, then you can sing this next song and truly mean it. I've experienced the goodness of God. Anybody here experienced the goodness of God before? Yeah? Amen. Let's sing this song together and just remember that God is faithful, he is true, he's a good father, and he desires to bless his children. Even in the midst of the hard times, God is there to carry us through. The Bible says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Even in the midst of the hardest times, we fear nothing that this world can throw at us because Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is right there walking with us. In fact, that that old poem about the footprints in the sand, sometimes he's carrying us because we don't even have the strength to stand, but he's wrapping us up in his loving arms. We experience the goodness of God. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will see of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful, and all my life you have been so, so good, with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire, the darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have been the goodness. You have been so, so good With every breath that I am made I will sing of the goodness Your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness is running after me with my life laid down and surrendered now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me sing that part again your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down and surrendered now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good, with every breath that I am made, I will sing of the goodness. All my life you have been faithful. Yes, you have, Lord. And all my you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made I will speak of the goodness of God Yes, I will 
Celebrating the goodness of God with all of you this morning. Thanks for worshiping through song. We're going to continue to worship with focus on missionaries and giving of our tithes and offerings. Pastor Dan's going to come and share the message. We'll do the switcheroo. The old spiritual switcheroo. You've probably wondered, I always wondered what that looked like. Well, that's what it is. I love this song we just sang, The Goodness of God. You know, sometimes in the midst of something, we can't always see God in it. But many of you know this. The older I get, the older we get, we look back on life and we look back and say, you know, all my life, God has been faithful doesn't mean that we haven't gone through some very tough and difficult times or we've struggled at times but all my life God has been faithful I love that that verse and all my life he's been so good we'll talk about that here in just a second as we get ready to take our offering today we're going to have our mission moment and today we're uh, going to Spain Spain is a huge mission field of about 46 million people and fewer percent know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But Jeremy and Crystal have an interesting approach to evangelism. Thousands of people come up from South America, have settled in Spain, and uh, many of them are Christians. So Jeremy and Crystal reach out to these immigrants, and they um, teach them how uh, English and how to share their faith with others around them who don't, do not know Christ as their Savior. Jeremy grew up as a missionary kid in Venezuela, and he and his wife Crystal served as missionaries in South America for several years before moving to Spain. And these are two of our missionaries that we support uh, through the cooperative program we talked about last week as we share our tithes and our offerings. And they are planting new churches in parts of Madrid that have absolutely no evangelical witness uh, in a Christian church at all. And so um, they're in a, uh, a very good spot for sharing, but also a very difficult spot. So we want to pray for Jeremy and Crystal as we um, pray for our offering. And I know you may probably not be able to see our offering prayer, but uh, we're going to share for those of you online watching through Facebook Live. We're going to share our offering prayer together, and uh, I will start it now. Heavenly Father, we honor you today as we worship. We recognize everything we have is yours. We open our lives to you for the service of your kingdom. We ask that you would bless these tithes in all that they will accomplish for your kingdom. Lead us to follow you in all that we do and say. Bless your people and their offerings today, Father. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we thank you for people opening their hearts and lives in so many different ways, some to foreign missions, some to home missions, some to missions just next door to that person who does not know Jesus, just as a witness. Father, just living our lives as we abide in you, living our lives as a reflection of you. And Father, we do fall short and we ask you forgive us of that. But Father, help us as a witness to share Jesus to those around us. Father, also help us to share in your kingdom through our tithes and offerings. And Father, I just pray that, uh, that you would bless the gift and the giver today. And Father, may these tithes and offerings uh, accomplish what you will in your kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. We come to the garden. Jesus prayed in the garden, and uh, it was a hard time, but God comforted him. And so I want to just give you an encouragement today. If you're going through a very difficult time, you feel like you may be in the garden sweating those drops of blood, God is with you, and he is uh, abiding with you, and he wants to encourage you. There was a, a man who needed encouragement, and here's our children's message today. Uh, this man was named Fred, and Fred was taking his pilot's license schooling, and he finally got it, and his first day he could fly alone. He went out to SeaTac Airport and hopped in his plane and took off. Now, the good part was the plane was a small plane with two engines, one on each wing. The bad part was... As he was flying around, one of the engines cocked out. Well, the good part, there was still another engine left. The plane could still fly. The bad part, after a while, the other engine conked out. The good part was Fred was wearing a parachute, so he jumped out of the plane. The bad part, the parachute didn't open, so he began falling like a rock. Well, the good part, he was over a lake, and he fell in the lake and landed in the water. The bad part is he didn't know how to swim. The good part was there a man in the boat that came and pulled Fred out of the water. The bad part was when Fred was getting in the boat, his boot knocked a hole in the side of the boat and the boat began to sink. Well, the good part was the man with the boat could swim and he pulled Fred to the shore. Whew. Now, there's a lot of goods and bads in that story. You know, as those of us who are older, we know that life is kind of like that, goods and bads, and we wonder, is this ever going to end? And then something good happens, and then something bad happens. But Psalm 107 and verse 1, I want to, I want to share with our kids, the Bible says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. There are some things in life that are good and bad, but the thing that we know that is always good is God. God is always good, no matter what. God always loves us. God always loves you, no matter what. So even though you may feel like poor Fred in that airplane, just remember there are things that are always, not just sometimes good or bad. The love of God is always, and the goodness of God is always. And we sing about the goodness of God. You're a good, good father. And we've sang about that this morning and, and reemphasized that. So remember, God is always good. Well, today in our adult lesson, we find ourselves in the second series that I called last week, A New Kind of Christian. Now, I want to define what I mean by that. First, we're not redefining what Christianity is. But then I thought about this phrase that it might cause some confusion among those who don't understand or the explanation or didn't hear it. So I want to emphasize this series. I, I just want to recall it a renewed kind of Christian a renewed kind of Christian, a, a new vision or a new way that we look at things as the Lord is working in our, our hearts in the sense of a new passion for Christ, a new way of looking at our responsibility in the community, a new way of looking at who we are in Christ, a renewed kind of Christian. And so in this second series today, I want us to look at the topic of abiding in Christ. And we're going to be in John chapter 15. It's here in John chapter 15 that we find out so much about the source of spiritual life and obedience. The world and false doctrines tell us nothing is free. There's no such thing as a free love to make God happier with us. We can't do anything to make God love us more. He already loves us perfectly. And Christ has saved us and that puts us in relationship with God. John 15 is one of the best answers to legalism and self-effort because a lot of people want to try to uh, attain uh, up to the standard of where God might be happy, and that's, that's not what it's about. It's all about Jesus. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser, that's the one who takes care of the vine. And so to start off in John chapter 15, we have this metaphor, Christ is the vine, and the father is the vine dresser or the husbandman. It's the same word. Or we could maybe call it the farmer, which on one hand, you've got the vine, which is firmly in the ground. It's the main part of the plant and everything else gets its sustenance from it. 
And Jesus said, I am the true vine. Now, the context of this passage is about bearing fruit. He says, I am the true vine. Now, what does that tell us? That tells us that Jesus recognizes there are other fake vines out there. There are other uh, things that people say are the vine. And, you know, we might be okay in comparing that to Buddhism or Islam or Hinduism, but these weren't what John had in mind when he was writing. What he had in mind was the, the Jews taught that salvation came by Moses and through a circumcision of the flesh. And the New Testament writers were constantly teaching against Judaizers who would come into the church and start saying that Christians must follow the old way, the old law. Grace is really not sufficient to cleanse us. We have to do something in order to attain our situation. And so there was a real legalism that came into the church. And they were saying what matters is if we keep the law. Well, if that was true, Jesus wouldn't have had to come and die for our sins. But we can't keep the law. So Jesus had to come and die for our sins. And, and we are saved by grace. So I want to look at the true vine, the true branches, abiding in Christ, bearing fruit, and see if this has a way of allowing us to, to see this a new way, this abiding if we can see that in a new way in Christ. And so I want to start out by reading John chapter 15, and we're going to hit several verses, but in verse 8, excuse me, right here. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Abide in me, I will abide in you. So let's talk about that for just a second. And before we do, let's pray again and ask the Lord to, to teach us through this. Father, we ask that as we come to this time of teaching, we invite your Holy Spirit to uh, illuminate the scriptures, to teach us, to have a, a renewed way of looking at the vine and the branches and what it means to abide. And Father, I pray for anointing upon myself of the Holy Spirit. I know I cannot teach without it. And may your Holy Spirit work through all of us and you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we want to ask the first question, what the vine, what is the vine? We want to answer that by what the vine is not. Okay. The first of all, the vine is not man-made. We know it's Jesus Christ. Now, why do we say the vine is not man-made? Because there's many man-made vines that people want other people to buy into and graft into. First of all, I, I mentioned this briefly last week, it is not the prosperity gospel. People are looking for answers. They're looking for, they're struggling. They're looking for money. They're looking for uh happiness or the way to pay their bills. And even though many Christians struggle in their faith, they feel sometimes like they need to see something to validate their faith in God. And for a lot of Christians, the validation comes in the form of giving to a ministry and then waiting for God to bless that gift 20, 25, 60, 100 times over. People say, I want to abide in the prosperity and promise of the Lord. There are so many false vines that take people away from the true meaning of Christ. Men have developed their own spiritual disciplines and, and vines so they can twist the scriptures. And people want to buy into some of those things. And at the same time, they, they want all the toys, but they want to be spiritual enough to walk with God. And it pulls us away from Christ. Let me give you an example. I was switching through the channels this past week. Uh, and I stopped on the Christian TV channel. And there was Jesse Duplantis taking, talking in the whole show about one thing. It was about, it was about money. Now, I'm going to tell you how I was talking about it. Lori said, we just watched 20 minutes and didn't hear one word about Jesus or living a Christian life. But rather how God is obligated to reward your gift to the Jesse Duplantis ministry at least 20, 50, 
or a hundred times over if you give to their ministry. And then he said, you have to claim it and receive it. And I'm going to tell you a quote. He said, quote, it's nice living on the top. And I want you to have some of that too. I want you to experience that with me. So you need to give your ministry gift to the Jesse Duplantis Ministries. Now, there is a vine that people are trusting in, throwing their money at a particular ministry, trusting that God is obligated to give them back 20, 50, 100 times over. That, that's not abiding in Christ. Now, God may, God may bless your, your gift as you give, but that's not what we trust in. There is a false vine that people make, and people try to abide in that for blessings. And so there are false vines. It's not a man-made vine. Secondly, the vine of Christ is not a man-made resolution. There's a lot of Christians who will metaphorically sign a covenant with themselves stating how they're, they're going to stick with it and finally do all the things that God wants them to do. Have you ever done that? Man, have I done that a thousand times. All right, God, here's what I promise. I'm going to write this down in my journal. I'm going to sign it. Here's what I'm going to do. And this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do this for you. And guess what I end up doing? I, I, I mess up. I don't do it. But I try and I want to. See, that's, that's a vine that I'm trusting in. I'm trusting in my own strength to be able to do that for the Lord. And it's not in a resolution. I didn't rest in him. I didn't cling to him alone. I, I wrote it down on paper and said, this is what I'm going to try to do. It never, ever works. And guess what? We end up feeling frustrated. And some people say, this God thing just doesn't work. And we feel guilty because we fail. And so we cannot do it on our own power. Number three, the vine is not a contorted view of Jesus where he is the vine, but we really pray to someone else like Mary. She's the one who gives grace and peace and strength. That's not trusting in Jesus as, as the vine. The Bible says there is no other name or power on earth, above earth or under the earth, except the power in the name of Jesus Christ. But there are millions who pray every day to a vine who is not Jesus. And number four, I wish it were this way, but it's not. The vine is not a buffet. In other words, abiding in Jesus is not a little of this and a little of that. And I'll stay away until I get hungry again and I'll take a little conviction, not too much. Maybe some conviction with a little fudge sauce on it. That makes it go down better. And a whole lot of forgiveness then I might come back when I need it for some compassion. Kindness looks good. But patience? No, I don't need any patience. I'm, I'm full now. I don't, I don't need patience. See, the vine is not a buffet. We can't just pick and choose what we want from the vine. Christianity is not a spiritual smorgasbord. It's abiding in Christ. Now let's talk what the true vine is. Secondly, Christ is the true vine, and the Father is the farmer or the vine dresser. Now, John 15, 2, let's talk about this just a second, because this gives a lot of Christians, a lot of people some trouble. John 15, 2 says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it so that it will be even more fruitful. Now, that's a little scary if you just break that verse down. So first of all, let's look at this. Who are the branches that, we, that the Bible's talking about? This verse tends to be a little confusing. There's two groups here, those that do not produce fruit and some who do produce fruit. And Jesus said, every branch in me, so, so we know the branches are in Jesus. However, some theologians see this phrase as a metaphor. They, they say, um, it's being in him doesn't mean having life in him or being saved. It's like saying Jesus came unto his own and his own received him not. They say these branches are connected with him, but they don't get their life uh, giving um, sap that they need that the vine gives from Jesus. So these, these are not saved people. Now, personally, I do not see it that way. Jesus said every branch in me. Now, those of us who are saved in Christ... 
there are some who produce fruit and there are some who do not produce fruit. But here's the deal. The Bible says, all those branches in me who do not produce fruit, he cuts off. You almost start to hear Darth Vader music there. I'm about to be cut off. I, maybe I'm not producing the fruit that I need to produce. What what have what is God going to do to me or 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 throw at me because I'm maybe I'm not the Christian I need to be and then we get into this works thing again. Well, let's look at this. The branches that do not bear fruit. It says he cuts off every branch that does not bear fruit. Now, the word cut off is not in the Greek. Here, the Greek literally says to take away or to raise up. The Greek word is iro. It means to raise up or take away. Now, there are some places in the Bible where iro means to take away. For instance, when Jesus is given the parable of the talents, and he gives one person one talent and another three and another five or ten, and the person with one goes and buries his because he didn't want to lose it, he didn't invest it. When the master comes back, he says, where's your talent? He says, I buried it. He says, give it back to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to iro it. I'm going to take it away and give it to someone else. Okay? So in that case, iro is a judgment term. But, but John uses iro in so many other cases, this, word, this Greek word that means to lift up. Now, why is to lift up an important term here when we talk about uh, fruit? We have to look at the context. In his book, The Secrets of the Vine... Dr. Bruce Wilkinson has a conversation with a vineyard owner in Northern California who says new branches have a natural tendency to trail down and grow along the ground, but they don't bear fruit on the ground. When branches grow along the ground, the leaves get coated in dust, and when it rains, they get muddy, and when they get muddy, they get mildewed, and the branch becomes sick and useless. Dr. Wilkerson, thinking about John 15, 2, says, what do you do then? Cut it off and throw it away? And the, the vineyard owner says, oh, no, no. The branch is much too valuable for that. We can get a lot of fruit out of that branch. What we do is go through the vineyard with a bucket of water looking for those branches. We lift them up. We wash them off. We wrap them around the trellis or we tie them up. And pretty soon they're thriving and producing fruit. Now, are we not more valuable to God than a single branch in a vineyard? Of course we are. And so the, the Father says, for those branches who are not bearing fruit, who are mired in the clay, in the dirt, I will lift you up. I'm going to show you another cool Greek word in just a second. How does God lift us up? How does he clean us off? Well, in Hebrews 12, 5 and 6, it says this, My son... Do not despise the chastening of the Lord. That means when the Lord tries to lift you up and clean you off, don't, don't kick against that. Don't be discouraged when you're rebuked by him or, or convicted of something that you've done. For whom the Lord loves, he chastises and he corrects everyone whom he receives. So the Lord has a way of lifting us up by convicting us, by chastising us, not by making us feel guilty, but by saying, come back. You're, you're in the miry clay. I want to lift you up. Now, let me ask you a question. Is there any of us who have not been unproductive in a season of our Christian life? <laughs> All of us have been. Aren't you glad God just didn't look down and say, oh, you're unproductive. I'm cutting you off. God doesn't do that. Rather, he lifts us up to progress in our life with him. This is why I believe this should not be, or it's unfortunate that it was translated to cut off, but rather he lifts us up so that we can heal and become productive. Now, what else does the vine dresser, the father, do for us? The vine dresser prunes the productive branches. Now, in a vineyard, there are many branches that produce fruit. And he says these are purged. And that's technically the term, or we might call it pruned. But he cuts just enough off of every branch that shouldn't, the things that shouldn't be there, so that it will make it productive. Now, what is the fruit? Okay, we've talked about what the vine is. We've talked about the branches that are in Christ. We're we're believers. Some are producing fruit. Some are stuck down in the mud, and he lifts them up, cleans cleans them off, and puts them so that they can produce. 
Now, that particular illustration is talking about grapes. What are Christians supposed to produce? Well, some people say the fruit of a Christian is another Christian. I don't think that's correct. I read this week a pastor said the fruit of a Christian is another Christian. We have to be soul winners. I simply look back because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I look back at the story of Noah. Noah preached 120 years without one convert, not one believer. He was a 120-year failure if we use that standard as a standard. Well, he, didn't wit he must not have witnessed like he should have. He did, maybe he didn't lead in worship like he should have. Nobody came. I mean, after, after 120 years, you might think somebody might get saved. Even if it's by accident, they might get saved. But nobody got, came to the Lord in 120 years. And the Bible says in, in 1 Peter that, Peter, uh, that Noah preached about the, the ark and the rain and the judgment coming, not one convert. And yet God looked down on Noah and his family. And here's what God said. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And he was the only, him and his family were the only ones that were spared on all of the earth. Besides, we as believers are not tasked with the job of saving people or winning people's souls. I can't save anybody. I can't win a soul. Now, I can witness and I can share and I can spread the seed and I can tell a testimony and I can be kind and I can show the love of Jesus. But that's up to God. That's up to the Holy Spirit to draw that person and get saved. But we can't win someone's soul. That's not in our power. But we do share. Now, look at the second thing. If um, Oh, you don't because it's not in your notes. You can write this down. The list of the fruit of the Spirit is found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Now, let me list this to you. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians tells us exactly what the fruit of the Spirit is. It's, it's spiritual in nature. It, is, it comes when we abide in Christ, where the character of Christ begins to come out of us, where the, the nature of Christ begins to come out of us. We go over in Matthew 3.8, and Jesus tells the hypocritical Pharisees and Sadducees to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Well, if there was anybody showing no fruit that was not bearing, it was the Sadducees and Pharisees. He said, he said, show fruit. You're not kind. You're not gentle. You're laying this burden of yoke upon the people. In short, the fruit we bear is effect, in effect is the evidence of God inside of us abiding in Jesus. It's really proof that we're alive and connected to the vine and that we're heirs of the promise. So we can say with confidence that there are really two kinds of people, two kinds of realities. One who receives uh, from the vine and bears fruit because of it. He's loved by God and nurtured. The other is just as much loved by God, but for some reason gets mired down into the clay and gets, gets into the dirt and gets mildewed, and God has, to, they, he loves them just as much as us uh, who are producing fruit, who are not in the clay, but he lifts them up, and maybe we have had to be lifted up from that miry clay, where we can be healed and be refreshed. So what is the outcome of abiding in Christ? What happens when we abide in Christ? Well, first of all, just like we said, there's evidence of the fruit of the that comes out of us. And secondly, I love this part. Here's what I was telling you a while ago. This is a really cool Greek word. We, we are clean. See, a lot of Christians, even though a lot of Jesus followers, even though we're saved, we still have guilt and we don't feel clean. Okay? But Jesus has forgiven us of all of our sins. I want to show you something. There's a word that Jesus uses here. Remember the word iro? It means to lift up. Well, the word kath, K-A-T-H in the Greek is added to Iro, and it means to purge or to clean. A catheter will cleanse or purge the kidneys. It allows that to be cleansed. The Greek word for clean and purged share the same root, Iro. And so Jesus said, when you are pruned, if you're bearing fruit, when you are pruned, here's the Greek word, kathiro. That means 
you are washed and lifted up. That's a cool word. The whole verse goes like this. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, I will lift up. Every branch in me that does bear fruit, I will cleanse, wash, and lift up so that you may bear more fruit. So he's always working on us. And I love verse 3. Jesus said, and you are already cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Here's what it says in the Greek. You are already kathyroed by the word that I have spoken to you. You're already washed and you're already lifted up. So there, we, we read it in the scripture and we get this idea that we have to be right or God's going to cut us off. No, God's, God doesn't want to cut us off. He wants to lift us up. He wants to clean us and he wants us to bear more fruit. And so it's by the word that we are cleansed. How do we abide in Christ? The word. We go to the word. It's God's living word. It is Christ's word. We have to be in Christ. Jesus said, you are clean by the word that I spoke to you. When we abide, he cleans us. When we abide, it's like we're washed. When we abide, it's like we're lifted up. We feel better. And we're put, on a, we're put on another level of the trellis when we abide, and we abide, and we abide. But when we don't abide, we either stay, we can't really stay where we're at. We, we start to go back down and get into the miry clay. And so we have to ask the question, is lifting us up and cleaning us up, is that part of the character of God? I would say yes, because Psalm 40 and verse 1 says, He lifted me from the miry clay and set my feet on a rock. So that is consistent with the character of God. Now listen to this next song. I'm going to sing it. Don't sing it with me. Just listen to the words. And I'm going to say you're probably glad that this song does not go like this. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. Because I was not bearing fruit, he cut me off and let me die. <laughs> Love cut me off. Is that, is that the way it goes? No. Listen, he heard my despairing cry from the waters. What did he do? Lifted me, now safe am I, right? He lifts us. That's the character of God. He doesn't wait for us not to bear fruit and go, ha ha, I'm going to cut you off. When we don't bear fruit, he lifts us up. Sometimes we feel that in the form of conviction. Sometimes we feel that in the form of, of something that we shouldn't be doing that we ought to be doing or we're doing that we shouldn't be doing. But he lifts us up. Christ made it simple, saying, You are already lifted up and clean through the word which I have spoken to you. That is good news. Now, very quickly, let's look at the practical application of bearing fruit. See, Pastor Kevin said very well this morning, all this academic knowledge doesn't mean anything if we don't put it into practice. So, how do we apply it? Well, let's look at some, some verses. We apply the fruit of the Spirit... In relationships. Now, we could talk all day about any of these. I'm just going to throw out a couple. Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. There's a fruit of the Spirit. Love your wife. Selflessly. Okay? So, the fruit of the Spirit is seen in relationships. And that goes through all of our relationships. Secondly, the fruit of the Spirit is seen in our salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 says, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and now in it stand firm. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. There is a fruit of the Spirit. We could take a verse for every fruit of the Spirit, but it, it applies in all of our relationships. It applies in our salvation. See, Christ declared the Father to the disciples, and they believed him. And that faith or faithfulness was the first spiritual fruit that really ex it, it showed itself and, and love. They bore the fruit of faith. They were being lifted up and cleansed to bear even more fruit. So I want to end with this. I want to talk about this one more time. What is abiding? 
I want to be left with this is why I really didn't talk too much about it at the beginning. As Jesus said, abide in me and I in you. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. What does it mean to abide? Some people think it's, it's kind of in a mystical sort of way. If I can get to the right state of mind, then I can abide in Christ. If everything is going okay, then I'm abiding in Christ. That's not it. Sometimes we think of abiding as an achieving way. When I feel spiritual, I can abide in Christ. When I become a better Christian, I'll start abiding. I don't deserve to abide in Christ with my past. I don't feel anything when I pray or read my Bible. Abiding does nothing for me. You see, it's interesting that people use that as an excuse. But most people don't say, man, I'm really sick. When I get better, I'll go to the doctor. We don't say that. We don't say, when I, I don't deserve to go to the doctor because I'm too sick. We don't say that. But somehow, people think that when it comes to spiritual things. So what is abiding? I'm going to close with this. We abide in Christ regardless of our emotions. Abiding is as simple as staying in Christ. <clears throat> that is actually what the, what the <clears throat> word means, is staying. I stay. I remain. That's what the word is. I remain in Christ. doesn't mean remaining saved. It just means because we're always saved, we can't lose that. It means that we are staying with Christ. We are listening to him. We're reading his word. It's the same word in the ancient Greek to describe someone staying at home, or a soldier standing fast on the battleground, standing, remaining, staying. Christ said, I tell you my word, and my word washes you. The fruit of the Spirit. Nothing will cause us to stop believing as Christians because he's promised us that he will finish what he started. And we're not going to say, I don't think I want to believe in Christ anymore. Uh, we, we have faith. That's part of the fruit of the Spirit. We have faithfulness. And Christ lifts us up when we kind of fall from that. He lifts us up and he puts us, he cleanses us off. He puts us on a trellis. Several years ago, in a severe ice storm we had here, not Snowmageddon a, few, a couple of years ago, but, but a few years before that, we had a very severe ice storm. We have a tulip tree in our front yard. It got so heavy with ice that it snapped off right in the middle of the trunk about a foot off the ground. Now the tree's about, oh, two, two and a half inches, and it was a, f a fully developed uh, tree, but it just, man, just snapped right off, had a little bit hanging on it. I liked the tree, so I didn't want to see it die. So I went and got a, I got a, a, a hose clamp, big enough to go around a, a radiator hose, and I unscrewed uh, it, wrapped it around that tree, connected it together just so I could slide. And then I took the tree and I pushed it up and I put the hose up there, clamped it down and said a prayer. <laughs> and um, all these, it, and it took. And all these years later, I was just looking at, at it this weekend. The, the bark has grown around this thing about an inch or inch and a half. And there's one little spot. You can still see the silver clamp down in it. Now, I can look at that tree and go, oh, it must have broken. I can see the clamp. Here in about a year or two, nobody's going to be able to see that clamp, but it's still inside there. Now, what kind of testimony can that, could that tree give if it could talk? Nobody can see the clamp, but it, it will say, you don't know this, and you can't see it. And I really can't prove it. But inside of me, I have something that saved my life. Now, you're just going to look at it as a tree. But that tree really does have something in it that saved its life. It's a metal radiator hose clamp. We have something in our life that has saved our life. And the way that we show that is through the fruit of the Spirit. The way the tree shows that 
is through what? How do I know that tree's still alive? Every year, it still produces those tulip flowers and those pods. It shows that it has something in it that saved its life because it's still bearing fruit. As us, people can't see that except when we bear fruit. What is that fruit? Love, joy, peace, patience, all of those things of the, the fruit of the Spirit. So I want to give you a challenge today. Allow God's grace, allow God's love, maybe to put a hose clamp on you in the area where you're broken. Now, what would that tree have said if it could talk? Man, that hose is too tight, that clamp's too tight. But I had to tighten it up enough that it wouldn't fall over. But I couldn't put it too tight that it would squeeze it in two. I was the vine dresser. I knew how to put that tree back together. God knows how to put us together. Allow God to, to lift us up. Allow God to put that hose clamp around something that may be broken. Because he doesn't do it to hurt us. And the Bible says his, his discipline is only to, not because he's mad. It's to bring us back into relationship and to allow us to bear fruit. And he says the same will bring forth much, much fruit. Now, what is his goal for our life? Let me read it to you in Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Our goal is to do good works. Well, if I'm down in the miry clay, I can't do that, and I can't get myself out. So God's going to lift me up, and he's going to cleanse me off, and he's going to put me on a higher plane where I can heal and begin to see the goodness of God, just like we sing of this morning. And so if you feel like you're stuck, I want to encourage you, allow the Lord to lift you up. If you feel dirty this morning, I want to encourage you, allow the Lord to wash you off. How do we do that? By abiding. Where do we abide? In his word. Why? Because he said, the words that I speak to you will make you clean. You see how it all fits together? We abide. We read his word. We meditate on it. It makes us clean. It lifts us up. We feel better. It puts us on a higher plane. So I want to encourage you to abide in Christ. Allow yourself to be lifted up and to be cleaned off because God loves you with an everlasting love. He doesn't want to just cut us off. He wants to lift you up. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for being a loving God. Thank you so much for not just cutting us off during those seasons of life where we, where we don't bear fruit. Father, we do truly thank you that you, you know what you're doing. That you have our best interests at heart. And so, Father, help us to re receive your lifting up and our, your cleansing off and help us to bear fruit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. During this song, we're going to sing, I'm going to be up here. I'm going to put my mask on. If you need prayer, I will be happy to pray with you. Or if you want to wait till after the service, I will still be up here. You can come up and share. Let's sing this last song together. With more grace when the burdens grow greater, who sendeth more strength when the labors increase to added affliction? He addeth his mercy to multiply trials, his multiplied peace, his love has no. Has no measure, his power has no boundary known unto man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. When we have exhausted our store of endurance when our strength has failed ere the day is half done when we reach the end of our hoarded resources the Father
Thank you for joining us this morning out here for Worship in the Field, online there on Facebook and out in the cars. We so enjoy getting together and just worshiping, celebrating the goodness of God, and then learning from His Holy Spirit as He teaches us through the Word. Thank you, Pastor Dan, for sharing the message with us this morning. Let's close together, recommitting ourselves to these three principles. We're going to love God, love others, and live the life God has called us to live. God bless you. Have a great week. See you next Sunday. The seven-day forecast looks remarkably good. 80-degree weather all week. So we'll see you next Sunday right here in the field.